Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to part five of the 7.5 lecture. This section will focus on developments in Russia in the second half of the 19th century and moving into the early 20th century. So this period is often referred to as the reform era of Imperial Russia. As their devastating loss in the Crimean War exposed many of Russia's weaknesses. And so the new czar, Alexander II, who ruled from 1855 to 1881, initiated a period of reform. After the Crimean War, it was clear that Russia had fallen behind Western European powers because of their low levels of industry. Russia lacked a sizable middle class that promoted liberalism economically, politically, and socially. Now, of course, this was a key difference for why Russia lagged behind Western and Central Europe. Also, the nobility who controlled the serfs did not constitute a force for modernization and reform. But even more than their small middle class, the continued practice of serfdom uh, proved to be the most burdensome problem for Russia and the biggest reason why they continued to be behind the rest of Europe. Russian landowners were unable to compete with foreign agriculture. Uh, serfs continued to be uneducated and unskilled, and there was considerable peasant dissatisfaction and unrest across the empire. And so facing these hard truths, the new czar Alexander I began to initiate many important liberal reforms. And as a result, Alexander II is generally considered to be the greatest czar in Russian history since Catherine the Great, and perhaps the most important liberal ruler in Russian history prior to the 20th century, because as we know, Russia does not tend to have a liberal history or tradition. So the most important reform, first of all, uh, from Alexander II was the Emancipation Act of 1861, <clears throat> which basically brought about the end of serfdom in Russia. Historians often note that both Russia and the United States had enslaved populations, the United States with the African-American slaves and Russia with the serfs. And in the 1860s, both countries emancipated their enslaved populations within their borders. Not that these were connected or influenced by each other at any point, but rather it shows a larger trend in world history and modernization. Now, Alexander II believed that ending serfdom was key to Russia's modernization. And as a result of the Emancipation Act, 23 million serfs were now made legally free of their landlords. This meant that peasants could now own property, they could have a choice in marriage, they could sue in court, they could trade freely, they could vote in local elections, which I'll explain more momentarily, they could even choose their occupation. However, despite all these freedoms, peasants had no new political rights at the national level. There was still no representation or voice for peasants at the national level. However, the emancipation did not have the transformative effect that Alexander II had hoped on the Russian economy because even despite the end of serfdom, many Russian peasants still lived in what we call mirs, M-I-R-S. A mir uh, was a little Russian village uh, which uh, was highly regulated. These little village communities often predated serfdom. So it's like, yes, these serfs were free of their landlords, but they still lived in these little villages that were highly regulated and, were and, these, and these peasants were expected to continue to, to adhere to certain traditions and expectations. The mirrors were frequently defined by collective ownership and responsibility which made it difficult for individual peasants to improve their agricultural methods, you know, and implement some of those new techniques and technology from the agricultural revolution in Western Europe. And it also made it difficult for these peasants to leave their villages. So ultimately, the emancipation of the serfs did not lead to a free land-owning peasantry as was seen in Western Europe, but instead an unhappy land-starved peasantry that largely followed the old methods of farming. 
And so Russia did not industrialize as quickly as it had expected to. But beyond the emancipation of the serfs, there were other notable liberal reforms from Alexander II. Uh, so for example, the creation of the Zemstavs. Zemstavs were local assemblies that allowed for a moderate degree of self-government in the little village communities. Uh, the Zemstavs essentially replaced the nobility's traditional authority over the serfs. Now, this is a significant step towards popular participation in Russian history. history. However, Zemstovs did not have any influence on national policy. They were policy. They were strictly local governments. The property system uh, that the property-based system of voting for Zemstovs gave an advantage to nobles and to the middle class. Right. So, even to vote for the Zemstovs, someone had to own. A certain level of property. And while obviously this allowed the nobles to control uh, local government, it also did give some members of the middle class political experience. Now the Zemstavs were able to levy local taxes, they could set local policies, again they were local governments. But there were hopes by some liberals in Russia that the Zemstavs could be expanded into a national parliament. And, uh, but that won't happen for quite some time. Beyond the Zemstovs, there were many successful legal reforms enacted in 1864. Uh, Alexander II created a regular system of local and provincial courts. So he created a, a court system uh, across Russia. He also codified a judicial code. So he created this judicial code, basically a, a series of laws. Um, that accepted equality before the law, which was one of the most important uh, modern developments um, in European politics. And also there was more state-sponsored education in parts of Russia, which led to a gradual increase in literacy, though still very far behind Western Europe. The beginnings of industrialization were even evident in Russia as a result of these reforms. Now, of course, Russia had fallen behind major industrialized nations in Western and Central Europe. Uh, but in their effort to catch up, there was a lot of government support for industrialization, which, as you remember, was quite common for continental countries. Russia needed better railroads, better armaments, and a better reorganization of the army. And so one of the first areas that they chose to focus on were the railroads. Between 1860 and 1880, railroad mileage grew from about um, 1,250 miles to 15,500 miles. In the 1880s and 1890s, we would even see the creation of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which stretched all the way across Russia and was a major industrial achievement. Now, railroads allowed Russians to export grain to Western Europe in exchange for machinery and profits. Now, this led to a lot of foreign investment, but also uh, it did allow Russia to begin some of its own industrialization. The railroad building also stimulated domestic manufacturing. Uh, industrial suburbs started to pop up around Moscow and St. Petersburg, and a class of modern factory workers, a proletariat, began to emerge, although they were still very small by comparison to the rest of Russia. Uh, steel industries, coal industries, and other heavy industry um, fields also emerged to support the expansion of the railroads. Now, industrialization also strengthened Russia's military, giving rise to more territorial expans expansion from Russia to the south, and to the east. However, by comparison to Western Europe, Russia's industrialization was still very slow. And this was due to its untrained labor force, as the vast majority of Russian people were still peasants working in agriculture. Those agricultural methods continued to be backwards, right? And so many people were still constrained by subsistence agriculture. And the middle class was still very small and did not have the political or economic influence that they might have had in Western Europe. 
Now, there were also many critics of uh, Alexander II, despite his attempt to impose these liberal reforms. Some people felt it was too much. Some people felt it was not enough. But this is a period where we start to see the rise of populism and more violent uh, and vocal opposition in Russian political history. Now, despite the reform era of the 1860s, Alexander II increasingly became more traditional and more conservative in the 1870s. This sort of represents the general cultural shift where realism began to replace romanticism in Russian society. In the 1870s, Alexander II did things like increasing censorship. He arrested political dissidents and sent them off to Siberia. He began to repress uh, ethnic minorities as well. But the growth of the working class, as small as it was, also began to encourage socialist thought in pockets of Russia though this repression of all political dissidents fo uh, forced uh, these early socialist groups underground to become secret societies. And over time, a radical populist movement emerged that wanted to create a utopian agrarian order or uh, implement that sort of Marxian revolution. The populist movement was defined by a group of people frequently referred to as the intelligentsia. And the intelligentsia are considered to be radical, articulate intellectuals. Uh, they tended to support westernization and modernization. Uh, they were often very well-educated uh, university students or professors. And they were also very hostile to the state. They believed that they were more intelligent and more qualified to take over uh, Russian society and create this new movement. Now, populism begins to emerge in Russia. Populism is essentially a political movement where the aim is to create a new society through the revolutionary actions of peasants. So again, you can see a lot of connection with traditional Marxism there. And so this began to lead to acts of violence intended to overthrow the czarist autocracy. Even beyond that, many intelligentsia were supportive of a concept called nihilism. Nihilism is spelled N-I-H-I-L-I-S-M, nihilism. These intellectuals were nihilistic, believed in nothing but science, and they believed that the social order should be completely wiped out and built up from scratch. Essentially, the attitude of like destroy it, burn it all down, and then build it up from nothing. Russia also saw the rise of anarchists uh, who resorted to terrorism. There was a series of assassinations and bombings in Russia in the 1880s through the beginning of the Russian Revolution. So this is all demonstrating to us that Russia was becoming increasingly unstable. So much so that in 1881, Alexander II was actually assassinated by a left-wing terrorist group known as the People's Will. And not surprisingly, the death of Alexander II led to reactionary conservatism by his successors. And we'll start with Alexander III. <clears throat> so Alexander III followed Alexander II. He is considered to be the most reactionary and conservative czar of the 19th century. He's known for his autocracy, his orthodoxy, and his Russification program, which is essentially the development of nationalism. Alexander III felt that the previous reforms had been a mistake, and he implemented, quote, exceptional measures to try to undo them. He extended the power of the secret police. Uh, he persecuted political dissidents, Marxists, liberals, socialists, populists, all of them, and he sharply curtailed the power of the Zemstovs, those local assemblies. His Russification program, which essentially was an attempt to nationalize the Russian Empire uh, and create a common Russian identity, was also very controversial and unrealistic, considering that Russia was actually a very multi-ethnic empire. Uh, Russian nationals were only about 40% of the overall population of Russia. So in this Russification program, 
all languages except Russian were banned in schools, um, which of course angered national groups and created new sources of opposition. Um, Russification was also seen in the state-sponsored anti-Semitism of the period. Uh, there were many pogroms. Pogroms are essentially mass murders and persecutions of Jewish communities in the 1880s. Uh, so many Jewish communities migrated to Central Europe or even the United States. Jews had been blamed for the assassination of Alexander II, even though that obviously wasn't true. Thousands of Jewish homes were destroyed. Uh, their businesses were disrupted or destroyed. And this anti-Semitism would continue um, under Nicholas II in a series of pogroms from 1903 to 1906, where where thousands more Jews were killed and millions emigrated. If you've ever seen the uh, show or the movie Fiddler on the Roof, uh, where a Jewish family has to flee their Russian village, this is the context, the historical context for that story. Now, as conservative as Alexander III was, um, his, uh, he was actually not the worst of the Russian czars of this period. He would be succeeded by Nicholas II in 1894, and Nicholas II con uh, promised to, con to continue the conservative policies of his predecessor. However, Nicholas II was a much weaker, more incompetent czar than his predecessors. Nicholas II, you know, is definitely a candidate for one of the worst monarchs in all of European history. All right, but despite these reactionary conservative czars, there were still people in the Russian government who are trying to push forward with modernization and industrialization. That brings me to Sergei Vitt. So Sergei Vitt was the Russian Minister of Finance from about 1892 to 1903. So he worked for both Alexander III and Nicholas II. And he was responsible for Russian industrialization during this time period in the 1890s. So Sergei Vitt aggressively courted Western capital and advanced uh, Russia's technology to build great factories in its major cities. This resulted in the rise of a small Russian middle class in these urban areas. He also supported the expansion of railroads, uh, government built uh, state-owned railroads doubled to about 35,000 miles by 1900. Russia was also placed on the gold standard for their currency to, strength, to strengthen the government finances and to also uh, allow them to be more economically competitive with the rest of Europe. And due to his efforts, by the year 1900, Russia was fourth in the world for steel production, behind only the U.S., Germany, and Britain. By 1900 as well, Russia was exporting half of the world's refined petroleum. But as in Western Europe, industrialization in Russia contributed to the spread of Marxist thought and the transformation of the Russian revolutionary movement after 1890 as these Russian workers continued to feel more and more exploited. And again, even though this may seem like significant developments for Russia, it is, but by comparison, they are still far, far behind the rest of Europe when it comes to modernization and industrialization, which is uh, made clear once again during the Russo-Japanese War. So you may remember that Japan had also begun to industrialize in the 19th century and Japan had embraced industrialization and done everything they could to, to industrialize and modernize as quickly as possible. And uh, the differences between Russia and Japan's reactions and, 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 and growth become very apparent here in the Russo-Japanese War. So the Russians by this point had established a sphere of influence as they expanded eastward into parts of Asia. They were trying to claim territory in Manchuria, and now wanted to also claim uh, the Korean Peninsula. But Japan, which was a growing power in the East, was not willing to allow uh, Russia's territorial expansion in the region, and so they went to war with Russia. Now, this ended up being a humiliating defeat of Russia by Japan, which was really surprising to many, many people. 
Um, the Russian Navy was more or less completely destroyed by Japan in the Pacific. Uh, and there was also a bloody war on the land. And this resulted in Russia abandoning their um, territorial expansion in Eastern Asia and instead focused exclusively on the Balkans and expanding into that region. Now, this war was really humiliating, but it also led to widespread public dissatisfaction as Russia lost yet another war. And so this actually became one of the most important causes of the revolution of 1905, as the Russo-Japanese War produced domestic unrest, political dissatisfaction, and food shortages as a result of the war effort. Now, before we get to the Russian Revolution of 1905, which is not the big Russian Revolution, we need to take a, a moment to look at uh, the development of Marxism and how it becomes what we'll call Leninism in, uh, in Russia, right? So this is very important um, information for understanding the development of sort of radical Russian politics and how they will affect the eventual 1917 revolution. So Marxism was really appealing to many Russian intelligentsia, right? Especially a man named Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, who we will just call Lenin. You can see a classic photo of Lenin there in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Now, Lenin was very attracted to Marxism, but he recognized that pure Marxism would not work for Russia because pure Marx, uh, Marxism required an industrialized nation. So Lenin is going to introduce some key alterations to Marxist theory to make it work for Russia. So Marxism, traditional Marxism, as you likely remember, says that the urban workers, the proletariat, need to unite against the bourgeoisie. But the problem here is that Russia has not industrialized enough by the early 20th century to have a proletariat like we might see in England or France or elsewhere. Instead, Russia has millions of peasants. The industrial proletariat, if anything, is a small minority in Russia. But Lenin claims that Russia can have a proletarian revolution without a proletariat. All right, let's keep going. Now, Marx also claimed that the proletariat must, must self-emancipate. But Lenin argues that a vanguard, meaning an elite group of leading revolutionaries, can seize power for the working class, right? So if there's an elite group of revolutionaries, these intelligentsia, which include people like Lenin, they can seize power in the government for the working class, on behalf of the working class. This means that Russia does not need a universal um, proletariat and that if they still have a lot of peasants, that is okay. Of course, this is a little bit self-serving for those, um, for that vanguard of leading revolutionaries, but we'll learn more about this later. Well, Lenin's theories became very popular among the more radical groups in Russian society. Uh, followers of Lenin became known as Bolsheviks which is spelled B-O-L-S-H-E-V-I-K-S, -E the Bolsheviks, also known as the majority. Um, they believe that private property should not be protected, uh, that the government should control resources to ensure equity among citizens. So this is, of course, uh, very traditional Marxist thought. And these ideas were particularly appealing to a lot of peasants in Russia who had little to no individual resources. And again, this movement of, of Marxism and Lenin's adaptations of it became popular for many Russian workers and peasants um, who were, became far more radical than their Western counterparts because there were no political outlets, right? You know, Russia was so conservative still that there was no opportunity for, for Russian peasants and workers and intellectuals to, to voice their opposition. And so the more they're suppressed, the more radicalized they become. All right, so now we get to the first of two Russian revolutions. There's going to be a small Russian revolution in 1905 and then the big Russian revolution in 1917. 
So the Russian Revolution of 1905 was an immediate reaction to the loss of the Russo-Japanese War, but it also was influenced by many long-term factors, the poor economy, um, the lack of resources, uh, the strain on the peasants and the middle class led to many people in Russia to begin to demand reform. So the key event for the Russian Revolution of 1905 is an event known as Bloody Sunday, which took place on January 9th of 1905. <clears throat> On Bloody Sunday, about 200,000 workers and peasants went to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg to demand reforms from the Tsar, who at the time was Nicholas II. As you can see in the lower photograph there on the left-hand side, the Russian military opened fire and killed hundreds of these uh, workers who were demonstrating in front of the Winter Palace, and this is what led to the revolution. The revolution consisted of a general strike in the Russian cities by workers, uh, peasant revolts across the countryside, and even mutinies by soldiers in the Russian government. By October of 1905, the Russian government was essentially paralyzed by the revolution, and it was clear that the Tsar was going to be forced to make some concessions. And so this is what led to the October Manifesto of 1905. So the October Manifesto, you can think of that as the resolution of the revolution. This was issued by Nicholas II, and it granted some civil liberties to Russians, uh, a certain degree of freedom of, of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press. More important, however, the October Manifesto led to the creation of the Duma, the first legislative assembly in Russian history on the national level. Basically, this is like a parliament for Russia. However, the Tsar retained absolute veto power over the Duma. And also, the revolutionaries were very divided um, in, the, in their acceptance of the Duma and who would be in the Duma, who would be the representatives. And those divisions undermined any real influence that the Duma might have had. Ultimately, you can think of the revolution of 1905 as similar to the French Revolution of 1830 because the property classes of Russia benefited at the expense of the workers and at the expense of peasants and other national minorities, whereas the middle class moderates were very satisfied, but the working class and the radicals were not. So again, very similar to the revolution of 1830 in France, which would also lead to a bigger revolution years later, much like the 1905 in Russia does. Now, Russia experienced a mild economic recovery between 1907 and 1914. However, this had nothing to do with the October Manifesto. This was largely due to um, a man named Peter Stolypin. Uh, Peter Stolypin was uh, Nicholas II's chief advisor um, from about 1906 to 1911. Uh, he would be assass he, Stolypin, would be assassinated in 1911. Um, but as the chief advisor, he was able to initiate some reforms that helped peasants and led to some mild economic recovery. He pushed through important agrarian reforms that helped to break down the collective village ownership of land in those mirrors that we discussed and encouraged more enterprising peasants. So again, some moderate agriculture reforms that allowed for some economic growth. But after Stolypin was assassinated by anarchists in 1911, Nicholas II went back to conservatism and became a reactionary and, and um, deliberately went through and tried to undo all of the liberal reforms and the concessions made in the October Manifesto. So ultimately, the revolution of 1905 was a failure. And what reforms did exist were, first of all, too little, too light, and second of all, would be rolled back later by Nicholas II. That is why we will see a bigger, badder, much more violent and significant revolution emerge in Russia in 1917. But that's another story for another day. Um, for now, we have one more section of 7.5 to get to, 
and that's going to be many of the tensions uh, that are occurring in Europe um, as we get closer to World War I. So stay tuned for that lecture.